Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about the black sheep in your family tree. Now, hopefully you had the opportunity to watch uh, the US version of Who Do You Think You Are last night. Uh, it's uh, hosted on TLC, uh, the, the learning channel by Discovery. If you didn't get a chance to watch that, um, I believe it'll be up on their website uh, later today. So if you haven't watched it, uh, you might want to tune out really quickly because uh, I don't want to give you any spoilers. This is a spoiler alert. Um, but one of the things that we learned in the episode last night was that Cynthia Nixon's um, great, great, great grandmother had been imprisoned in the state of Missouri. And because she was imprisoned, there were a lot of records that were created. And so that's one of the reasons why we love our black sheep ancestors is because oftentimes more records are created about them and then by nature, their family because of that imprisonment. So what we're going to talk about today is where you can go to find um, prison or convict records uh, and then just some additional resources available to you offline. So we'll look at resources on Ancestry.com and then also some direction about some offline resources available so that you can start to put together the story of the convict ancestors or the black sheep in your family tree. Let's go ahead and dive in. Let's just start with uh, where uh, you're going to find what records exist online at Ancestry.com. So we're going to start with the card catalog, which is actually where all of all good research begins on Ancestry.com, as far as I'm concerned. So uh, if you're not familiar with the card catalog, you're going to find it under search. Just hover over that button. It's going to be the bottom option there, card catalog. Now we'll talk in just a minute here about some just some title searches that you can do, but if you're not, if you haven't used the card catalog a lot, you might not realize that you can use these filters on the side over here to actually get you exactly where you need to go. We do have an entire category for tax, criminal, land, and wills. So all of the kinds of records that are usually generated by, by the court system are grouped together. So when I filter down to that, I'm going to see an additional breakout of record type. And I'm looking here for court, governmental, and criminal records. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And then you'll see my, my filter then turns into a location filter. So I can then filter by a specific location in order to see what additional records exist. Now let me just scroll up to the top here. This card catalog, always the default sort is always popularity. So you're going to see those most popular record collections right at the top of that list. One of our most popular record collections in this category is the England and Wales criminal registers. Okay? These are fantastic records. They cover a 100 year period of time, 1.5 million records in this particular collection. They're just fantastic, fantastic records. And so I'm going to come in here and do a search. I actually have an ancestor who, an ancestress, <laughs> who was convicted of a crime, um, sentenced to serve out her time in Old Bailey, the prison Old Bailey. And then she ended up being stuck on a convict ship and shipped to the United States uh, where she was sold into indentureship um, to a man who was less than stellar. I have a copy of his will and it's just not pretty. His personality comes out in it. Um, and unfortunately, well, fortunately for me because I exist, but unfortunately for her, um, he, she father or she, uh, he fathered two children by her, um, again, kind of in a forcible relationship. And so, so we see some of these circumstances, we start to see some of these circumstances when you collect a prison record and then follow that record through to this indentureship record and then follow that record through to this probate record for this man who purchased her indentureship. So um, so I've always been fascinated by uh, the England and Wales criminal registers. Her record is not in here in particular, but um, we're going to look at just an example so that you know uh, what it looks like. It's just a ledger. Uh, the, the England and Wales criminal registers, just a ledger. And if you look at the top of the page, you can see the year and the location. So in this case, it's Lancaster in 1842. It will list the name of the person, uh, the information about how old they were, 
what session or what court session uh, they were tried in, what their offense was, and then over here there are columns about sentencing. So whether they were sentenced to death, transportation, usually to one of the colonies, Australia, America, um, imprisonment, like if they were imprisoned, what the sentence was, what the term was, if they were whipped or fined, <coughs> excuse me, and then if they were acquitted or if there was a commutation of their sentence. And so it's really interesting, like I said, even if you're not, even if you don't have family members in these particular records, to start to look through them because you get a real feeling for the period of time. Um, this first one just kills me, right? His sentence was keeping a disorderly home, or that was his crime, and he was sentenced for three months in prison for that. What? Okay, I, I would be in so much trouble. Some of them, of course, are going to be more serious. Assault, there's a couple of, of gentlemen here who have been uh, sentenced because of assault, um, exposure, um, selling um, things, larceny. Okay, uh, one of the things on this next page that actually fascinated me, and the reason I chose this record, is all of a sudden I started seeing a whole group of men who had committed the same crime. And the crime was sedition, seditious conspiracy and riot. And then there's just like page after page after page of men who are, of men in their, mostly in their late teens and early 20s, who have been convicted of this crime of seditious conspiracy and riot. All sentenced, almost all of them were sentenced to a year. There's one lone guy here down at the bottom of the page who actually, or maybe it's the next page, who actually was proven not guilty. Out of all of these men, one at the bottom of the next page who has a sentence of, uh, or has a, a judgment issued of not guilty. Everybody else was convicted. And so that makes, that just, I mean, the genealogist in me is dying. I really want to just go dig into this and figure out what was happening in Lancaster in 1842 that caused all of these men to riot. And right here it actually even states that they called a special session of court in order to try all of these men. They didn't wait for the regular court session. So fascinating, fascinating records <clears throat> that in aggregate sometimes tell stories or lead us to historical information. So if you want to explore a record collection just to kind of get a feel for the kinds of records available, this England and Wales Criminal Register, which will be the first one that comes up on your list, uh, I encourage you to go spend some time with it. Now, we talked about how to get there. You're going to use the filters, tax, criminal, land, and wills, um, and then you're going to filter further to court, governmental, and criminal records. Now, I've listed here on the screen several keywords if you just want to do a title search. Because when we get to this filter, I don't know if you noticed this, there are still 696 databases on Ancestry.com, 696 different record collections that fall into this court, governmental, and criminal records category. I could further um, filter it by location, but even if I was looking for something in the US, that still just leaves me with 547 databases. And you'll notice very quickly, their government records too, mixed in with the criminal records. So if I'm interested in seeing specifically what criminal records exist, it might be a little easier to do some searches by keywords. And so here I've created a list of all of the keywords or the title words that are available or that exist in our databases right now that will bring up all of the titles. So the words are prison or prisoner, penitentiary, pardons, convict or convicts, criminal or criminals, jail, and then of course the British spelling of jail. Okay, so let me just show you how that works. If I come in here and I type in the word prison, I'm going to get just a few databases, 17 of them, that contain very specifically prison records. Now, some of those prison records, again, are going to be from the UK. One of these sets of prison records is actually from Andersonville Prison, which was a Civil War prisoner of war prison. So we have those as well. Um, there's a book here that's the true story of Andersonville Prison. Uh, employee ledgers fra, from the state of Texas. Okay, um, Holocaust records, um, imprisonment records. Okay, You're going to see several of those kinds of things. Several books, some newspapers that have some information. Um, New, uh, New York prisoners received at Newgate Prison. Newgate State Prison was the first uh, state penitentiary in New York opened in 1797 and the records are for a really limited period of time but really valuable if you have family um, who lived in uh, in New York at that time. It was a state prison. 
large collection here, we'll talk about these in just a minute, the California Prison and Correctional Records cover almost 100 years. There's uh, about a quarter of a million records in that collection, a little more than, and those are brand new. We actually just put those online just a couple of weeks ago. Let's take a look at those. One of the things about California records, these records actually have images, like amazing images attached to these records. And very often you're actually going to find multiple records about a person. And let me show you why that is. Whenever you're looking at a new database on Ancestry.com, I hope that you will always scroll down past the search box and look at a couple of things. The first thing you're going to want to look at is the source information. That's going to tell you where Ancestry.com obtained these records in order to put them online. And in this case, we got them from the California State Archives. They have a collection of records called the Department of from the Department of Corrections, and then here's the breakout of the different prisons or um, organizations who who feed into that record collection. Below that, there's going to be a database description. That database description is going to give you information about the laws of the time, about when some of these prisons um, operated under what jurisdiction the prisons operated, and maybe some even some interesting facts. For example, right here, one of the things that's listed is that Folsom State Prison, which of course is, is famous because of Johnny Cash, <laughs> Folsom State Prison opened in 1880, and it was the very first prison in the world with electricity, uh, and it was one of the earliest maximum security prisons in the United States. And when it opened, the, the first prisoners were actually transfer prisoners from San Quentin Prison. And so, again, information in these database descriptions often gives you context, not just so that you understand more about the records that you're looking at and what exactly it is that you're dealing with, but also so that you understand the context and the history of the time. One of the things that I love about the TV show, Who Do You Think You Are?, is that they tell the story around the circumstances so that you understand things in context. That gives you more connection and more information about your ancestors than just a piece of paper or some information on a document. So for example, last night, as Cynthia Nixon was um, learning about this great, great, great grandmother of hers who had been imprisoned, contextually it was important for her to understand that this woman was only the second woman who had ever been convicted in the state of Missouri. And so, when, and she was the only female in the prison at the time that she was imprisoned there. So she was kept, you know, in her cell. She took her meals in her cell. Like she had to spend uh, more time in her cell than likely the other prisoners did because she was the only female. It also put her in a very precarious position um, uh, with the other prisoners and with the guards. And then we later learn in that episode, again, big spoiler alert, um, we later learn in that episode that um, she, that because of her circumstances, there were laws that were changed. So context often gives us more insight into what our ancestors experienced. So these database descriptions, we try to provide you with some of that context so that you can do some additional research on your own to learn more about the circumstances surrounding why your ancestor might be included in this particular record collection. Now, one of the things we also do is provide you where we can with some details about what's in the collection. So this is the California prison records, but specifically it is for Folsom and San Quentin with some information about the California Youth Authority, which uh, particularly was over the California School for Girls the Ventura School for Girls, <coughs> excuse me, and the Whittier State School. So just some detailed information about what's included. Where images exist in any database, you're also going to find that same information over here, uh, the same collection information over here under Browse This Collection. If I wanted to browse directly to records, for example, for Folsom State Prison, I could just do that right here. It's going to give me a list then of what's included, descriptive list of convicts, identification cards, a photo album, um, uh, additional photographs of the, inma of the inmates, mug books, prison registers, okay? And you'll notice that some of these things overlap. And so that is why when we do a search, we very often are going to find multiple records for a person. So I did a search here for Ed Morrell. He was a, a train robber in the 1880s and 1890s and I think he ran with the Evans gang 
And so he was uh, caught and convicted. And you'll see here, as I did the search for him, there's actually three records that come up, three different records. And so let's just quickly take a look at these three different records so that you can get an idea, again, for what it is that you're going to be looking at or looking for. This record was created in 1894, so the first thing that comes up is actually a prison registry. It says right across the top, register and descriptive list of convicts and sentence of imprisonment in the state prison of Folsom. Very much like the England criminal registers, you're going to see information about the person, the crime they committed, how long they were convicted for. Um, sometimes in this case, there's not just an age, there's also occupational information, height, uh, information, uh, descriptive information about their um, complexion and their eyes and their hair uh, so that you can get a feeling for um, what these men looked like. Now, you don't just have to get a feeling for what these men looked like. Uh, very often, in these California records uh, especially, there's going to be photograph books or photographs, basically mug shots that have been created and compiled uh, uh, you, can, you can match it up with their prisoner number that was on the register to make sure you've got the right man, not some other William Smith. Here we've got a William Smith and who knows how many of those there are and how many of those may have been um, convicted through the California state prison system. And so the, there's a prisoner number right at the top. Um, and then some uh, additional information about them. So here is, here's our buddy Ed, the, the train robber. And you'll see here he was uh, convicted in Fresno. His crime was robbery. Uh, he was sentenced to life. And he was put into prison uh, uh, in 1894. There's this little remark here, though, that he is actually serving a second term or a second sentence. Um, so probably why he was sentenced to life was the first time he didn't learn his lesson. So uh, then there is an additional record here. This is called the descriptive list of convicts, which provides maybe some additional information about this particular prisoner. In this case, it provides a birthplace um, and some information if they were transferred or uh, sent to a different prison during their incarceration. So be aware that in some of these record collections, there might be multiple entries, sometimes even just for a single conviction. Now, of course, if your ancestor or relative was a particularly bad guy, uh, there may be additional, uh, um, there might be additional incarcerations, there might be additional records created, sometimes in the same state, sometimes in a different state. You just kind of need to be aware of that. I mentioned those New York prisoner records uh, for that first state penitentiary in uh, the state of New York just cover about a 15 year period of time. But again, read that database description, take a look at what it is. Um, it gives conditions in the prison. That's often um, information about um, the, con the conditions in that prison and the conditions that they lived under. And then in this case, this particular prison closed in 1828. Anybody who was still in the prison in 1888 was then sent to Sing Sing. Uh, and so you have details then about where to look for your next set of records. So read those database descriptions. Okay, a couple of other, just let me just walk through some of these keywords again. So prisoner, prisoners, penitentiary, pardons, convicts, criminals, uh, singular and plural, and then uh, jail records. And so again, you just type the word in the, in the title field, hit search, it's going to show you what records Ancestry.com has available online that have that word in the title. And we do have records from several countries around the world uh, that that are prisoner type records. One of the other uh, record types that uh, I find particularly fascinating, we have a set of convict lists um, out of um, England, criminal, we have a set of convict lists out of England that are actually for ships. The jails got so crowded that they started repurposing some of their old ships, sticking them out in the harbor and people were um, jailed on board the ship. And so you'll see some of those records as well. So just hopefully you can get a feel for how to use the card catalog just to see what records are, are available. Let me just remind those of you who aren't familiar, as familiar with the website, um, using the card catalog is going to be better than doing what we call a global search. Now if you just come in here and click search, what you're doing when you use this search box is you're searching all 14 billion records or 15 billion records available on Ancestry.com. And our most popular, most used, most requested, whatever, 
collections are always going to come up at the top of your search results. So some of these more obscure collections are going to be so far down in your search results that you might not ever get to them or even notice them. And so uh, the purpose of the card catalog is to get you to a specific collection of records so that you can search it specifically for your ancestor. So certainly never going to come up in a shaky leaf hint because we only hint the top 10% of our databases and likely not going to be noticed in a global search because you're searching all the records in the world um, and sometimes you need to do something more specific. So that's what the, the benefit is of the card catalog. Now there are a few other things you're going to be able to find online. Ancestry.com has newspapers. We also have a separate website called newspapers.com. If you noticed again last night in the episode of Who Do You Think You Are? Cynthia Nixon actually went to the state library and looked through on microfiche some newspapers to find articles that had been written at the time that her great 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 grandmother was convicted. And so you can just check the newspapers online for sure. That's a great place to start. Um, see what we have available if we have records available for the location where your ancestor may have lived or committed their crime or been convicted. Um, but if we don't have those records available online, then there are some offline resources that you should consider for newspapers. There's also some offline resources you should consider for some of these prison records. The first one is going to be the National Archives. If your ancestor was convicted of any kind of a federal level crime, um, the Bureau of Prisons records are available at the National Archives. Um, they actually have a website, archives.gov. You can go to their website and they have an online searchable catalog of what records they have. So you can go search their Bureau of Prison records. Um, it's not gonna allow you to search the actual records themselves. It's just going to give you um, card catalog level, database description level information so that you then know what to contact the National Archives or visit the National Archives and look up, okay? Also, state archives. So most frequently, um, your ancestors, were, if they were a black sheep, were not going to be convicted of a federal crime. They may have been convicted of a more local or state level kind of a crime. And so state archives very often have the Department of Corrections records, much like those California prison records, Ancestry.com obtained those from the California State Archives. Um, Cynthia Nixon visited the Missouri State Archives to access the information about her ancestor. So state archives, many of them also have websites with online catalogs. Some of them have begun to digitize records, but most of those records are still going to be available offline. You have to either visit the archive yourself or search their catalog for the kind of collections you're interested in and then write to the archive for some research assistance. County courthouses are also excellent resources and county archives for local records. Um, if my ancestor, and I do have one, was convicted of public drunkenness, that was a local crime. He didn't kill anybody. It wasn't robbery. It wasn't, you know, seditious rioting. Um, it wasn't a, a, a major crime. It was just a small crime, a petty crime. And so uh, I found records on this particular ancestor in a county courthouse where he was um, convicted of public drunkenness, had to spend two weeks in prison and pay a small fine. Just a small notation, but again, those records give us an insight into their personality, into their circumstances, um, lots of interesting information. In the case of this particular ancestor of mine, his public drunkenness, he actually was um, charged on three separate occasions. And interestingly enough, his wife was not just a teetotaler, but she was an advocate for prohibition. And it's no wonder, right, if she had this husband who was continually getting into trouble and they were continually having to pay fines and he was in prison and who knows um, what other circumstances his drunkenness caused in their home outside of that. But again, those records start to give you this feeling or this um, story that you can shape based on the records about the circumstances of their lives. So county courthouse records. And then local newspapers. A lot of small town local newspapers are going to have bigger, better articles about the happenings in their community than maybe a, a state newspaper or a larger regional newspaper. 
And many of those uh, local newspapers are available in local libraries. So if you can visit or contact the library where your relative may have lived, very often there are librarians who are so wonderful and willing to help um, look this information up uh, on their microfilm or microfiche collections of these old newspapers and sometimes for just a few dollars in copying fees they will email or mail you copies of those articles or newspapers. So always check the websites for the local libraries in the place where your ancestor may have lived uh, if they have an online catalog that says that they have those newspapers in their possession, excellent, then you know exactly what you're looking for. If they don't, just pick up the phone and give them a call. Ask the librarian if they have access to those newspapers, and if they don't, uh, ask them if they know who does. Sometimes those newspapers are aggregated into larger regional libraries. Sometimes they're held, uh, as in the case of, of last night's episode, in a state library. So uh, local newspapers offline are a gold mine, gold mine of information, but it does require a little bit of a uh, little bit of legwork on your part. OK, uh, let me just wrap up with some ethical considerations. Um, you know, when you're talking about a great, great, great grandmother, um, it's really easy to get caught up in the story and the history of the thing and the sensationalism of what they might have done and why they may have done it. And, and we want to dig into these records and tell these stories. But some of you are going to come across in your research um, some information about some more recent people. And so let me just give you some considerations when you're, when you're thinking about putting this information in your tree or telling these family stories. First, um, is the person who committed the crime still living? If they are still living, uh, you need to just respect that person's privacy. Yes, they committed a crime. Yes, that crime may have been splashed all over newspapers and readily available for anybody. But think about um, maybe not just the person, but the other people in that person's life and how they might be affected um, by us um, recording and maybe even sometimes sensationalizing this information. So just be really respectful. That's what I'm asking you to do. Be really respectful. Um, information about living people, when you put it in your tree on Ancestry.com, is privatized. So you can see it because you are the tree owner. But as long as you have a birth date in there and nothing in the death date field, that person's marked living, uh, then nobody else can see that information unless you specifically invite them to. So, uh, so we do privatize information about living people. But as you collect some of this information and, and tell some of these stories uh, in your family, just be respectful of the people that are still living. And even if the person is not still living, you know, if it's a, if it's a parent or a grandparent, uh, sometimes there are people in our families who are um, more sensitive to this information than others. Um, they're more hurt, they're more embarrassed, um, maybe part of the crime um, affected them directly. And so we just need, again, to be respectful of that. Um, yes, you can record it. Yes, you can write the story down. Just be really careful with who you share it with and how you share that information. We don't want to hurt or embarrass any additional family members, and we certainly don't want to alienate them um, for a multitude of reasons. And if there's any question, just ask. Be willing to have a conversation. Um, I have an uncle, a great uncle actually, my grandmother's youngest brother. He was born uh, when my grandma was 16 years old, and um, I have grown up and known and loved my Uncle Don, but I've always heard like rumors and stories around the family that he uh, was a little bit more wild in his younger days. And one day when doing some research, um, actually I wasn't even researching him, I was researching his grandfather, uh, but that family has a very unique last name and I came across some newspaper articles about some uh, less than stellar things that my Uncle Don had been involved in. And I called my dad and I asked my dad if he knew about it and he had no idea. Um, and then I called my grandma and she had no idea. And I thought, well, I want to, I want to keep this newspaper article. So I, so I kept the newspaper article. I recorded the story in my tree, and then the next time I had the opportunity to go visit my uncle Don in Las Vegas, I actually just sitting right there at the lunch table in the middle of a restaurant with my dad and my sister, I asked him about it. I said, so Uncle Don, tell me about the time that you were shot in the casino. Uh, what was that all about? 
and he he first he blushed bright red with oh, his red hair it was kind of funny um but then he just laughed and laughed and he said you know he said i didn't do so so, so many great things in my childhood and my youth and he said i'm glad i've had a long time to a long life to get over some of those things and um and then he explained he explained the circumstances and he said that it was perfectly okay for me to record that in the family story that m my uncle don passed away a couple years ago and and that information is now public because his um because his tree, uh, because he's marked deceased in my tree, uh, but I had asked him uh, ahead of time if it was okay that that information was known by the family, and he was very gracious in in letting us share that information because he was hopeful that people would learn from his mistakes. So in my case, it worked out well. In some of your circumstances, it might not be as great of a situation. So just keep in mind if some of these crimes or these uh, black sheep that you uncover in your family are a little bit more recent just be sensitive to the to the people involved in the situation and to the immediate members of those people uh, other than that if you start digging into great 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 grandparents or in my case this fifth great grandmother out of England um, those stories like I said give us this really amazing insight into the choices that they made why they may have made some of those choices and why their lives may have taken the direction that they that they took in the end I'm always grateful their lives took the direction they took because Every one of those choices led to someone being born, that led to someone being born, that led to my existence. And I um, always feel a really strong connection with them when I put it into that perspective. So uh, that's all I have available for, uh, prepared for you today. Hopefully this inspires you to go look for your own black sheep and to record their stories and to collect as much information as possible so that you aren't looking at just one criminal ledger that said they may have killed somebody but that you're looking at the whole story and seeing if you can find the motivations behind why that event may have happened. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.